Hello and welcome to Carnivorous Chats. My name is James, your host. I started this podcast to help other folks share their own healing stories and to interview thought leaders and experts in the carnivore, keto, and low oxalate space. Before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out to Equip Foods and the Carnivore Bar. As an affiliate, you can use the link in the show notes to get a discount on their products when you check out using the code Carnivorous. Thanks in advance for listening, subscribing, and any likes or shares. And now, on with the podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carnivorous Chats. It's James, your host. It's season three, folks, and it's the premiere, and I'm so happy to have today's guests along. We're going to get into the very fun, quote unquote, subject of oxalates, oxalate toxicity, dumping. I have Doris Adamitz with me today. Mm -hmm. Doris, what a pleasure it is to have you. Welcome to Carnivorous Chats. Thank you so much, James. It's a pleasure to be with you. Doris and I first connected in the Low Ox Warriors group on Instagram, and I was immediately intrigued by her story, what a voice of compassion and reason and explaining about oxalates that she had. And I was really hoping to have her on the podcast. So again, I'm so thankful that she's here today to discuss with us her journey into oxalates, what's been happening since. So I wonder, Doris, if you could do the listeners a favor who haven't heard your story before. I know you recorded a podcast with our dear friend, Michael Matthew, and um, I'll link to that in the show notes. But for those who haven't heard your story, I wonder if you could start from the beginning and explain to us about how you grew up, what type of foods you were eating, and what happened. Sure, and thanks for the kind words, the introduction. That's very sweet, James. I appreciate that. Uh, Yeah, so I grew up in rural Germany, um, and we ate a lot of high oxalate foods. Uh, Our yard was full of all sorts of things that my parents grew, because that's a cheap way to feed a large family. And so when springtime came around, it started with the rhubarb coming up and us kids being outside all the time, that would be the first thing we would choose to just rip out of the ground and go inside quickly and grab the sugar, dunk it in and eat it because you didn't even have to go inside. You know, you could stay outside and play. Then there were gooseberries and red currants. There was a big wall of blackberries against the south side of the garage. So all summer long, we basically snacked on high oxalate foods. There was a lot of wheat in the form of Spätzle, which is like a German specialty. Um, It's kind of like pasta, lots of potatoes. And every winter, my sister and I would get sick, like eight weeks of just runny noses, horrible coughs, fevers every now and then. And we'd go to school because we couldn't miss eight weeks, nine weeks of school. And nobody ever got sick. It wasn't anything that was contagious. You know, our teachers would look at less funny, like, what the heck are you doing here? Hacking like that, sniffling like that. But nobody else got sick. And looking back now, I know that was oxalate dumping even back then, because in the wintertime, we didn't have all those foods. You know, you'd eat them. Yeah, we had a little bit in the freezer, but that was gone pretty soon. You know, and there'd be rhubarb and strawberry compote that you'd have with the waffles and rhubarb strawberry pies that would happen every Sunday or Saturday when we went to my grandma's. I mean, everybody ate a high oxalate diet. And it's funny to look at this now because you can see in your relatives and everybody's health issues, how you can finally explain all of the issues they dealt with, you know, from my aunts and uncles to my mother and my father and my twin sister, it is all high oxalate related stuff that went on. It's pretty sad, actually, to think about how this could have all been prevented by stuff to eat that stuff. It sure is, Doris. And looking through what I went through and what we're going to discuss you went through in terms of terms of your health and that lens now, I am so happy that we have the advocacy in this area because it was lacking for so many years. So folks like Sally Norton, folks like Monique Attinger, folks like yourself, folks like Low Ox Grandma Jeannie, that, that you know, talking and getting the word out about high ox diets. And we're going to get to where you find out about that because there's still a ways to go. Doris, when you were talking about you were getting sick, uh, what type of things were you talking about? It was like uh, a flu type symptoms, asthma. I know you mentioned you used to get infections in your nail beds or something like that. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was part of it too. Uh, Yeah, it was um, mainly coughs and runny noses and just stuff coming out from the lungs from like deep down, just all sorts of mucusy, disgusting crap. Um, and I used to get infections on my nail beds where it was just out of nowhere, 
they'd be pussy. And there was no reason for it. I didn't have an injury. There was no hangnail that ripped or anything. It would just get swollen, hurt, and then there'd be pus coming out. And going to the doctors, there was no help. Even back then, as a kid, they couldn't explain why that was happening. And there were definitely times, even back then, where I thought, well, I'm just going to die early. That's it. You know, I just have genetically, I'm just screwed. There's something terribly wrong with me. We often hear us oxalotoxic uh, folks talk about when we were at our sickest, even from you, wow, at a young age, thinking that we got a lemon of a body. (laughs) And when we really realized that it was what we were putting in our mouths and our body was sending us signals to tell us, hey, wait a minute, please stop, please slow down. You go, oh my goodness, if I had known then what I know now. However, I'm just thankful we know now because I'm sure there's so many people around the world that are no longer with us that wish they had the knowledge now that we're getting, Dar. So again, thank you for sharing your story. There was a particular part in that interview with Michael that struck me. And before we go on, I'd just like the listeners to understand, Doris, you were never fully vegetarian or vegan at any points in your dietary. No, never. There was maybe two weeks when I was 19 where I thought, oh, maybe I'll try vegetarianism. And I cut out the meat and the eggs and stuff. And I did that literally for two weeks. And all I could think about all day long was food because I just ate and 30 minutes later, I'm hungry again. I was thinking this is not sustainable for me. I mean, I can't get anything done. All I think about is what am I going to eat next? What am I going to make next? So that one just went right out the door. And Doris, this is such an important point for folks because yes, I was vegan. Yes, I was vegetarian and pescatarian for many years. However, one can become oxalate toxic still having predominantly meat in the diet. But if you're eating the high ox stuff like you were and still eating meat, it really does not make a difference. You're going to accumulate these oxalate crystals irregardless. So I think it's a very important point to talk about. I've often talked about, you know, not having the calcium in my diet with being a vegan and how profoundly detrimental that was because I was bombing myself daily with orders of thousands of milligrams of oxalate. It was just (laughs) insane how I did not kill myself. I don't know because I literally felt like I was dying and looked like it too. But um, one thing that struck me, Doris, that we like to talk about because I had this too, was you mentioned that you had a lot of early onset chemical sensitivities, not chemical sensitivity, but sensitivities to smell, particularly coffee was a big one for you. Talk to us about that. Yeah, for two years. And this only happened in the winter time. Like as as soon as the snow started falling, um, every Sunday, uh, all the rest of the siblings would come over and the nieces and nephews would come over to our parents' house and there'd be cake and coffee, which is a German tradition. In the afternoon, around three o'clock, you have cake and coffee. And as soon as my mother would brew the coffee, I would have to hide out in my room because I would start puking my guts out just from the smell of coffee when I was like 12, 13 years old, those two years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that was the only time early on where I was sensitive to smells that really elicited such a strong physical reaction. Okay. And did it come back later on? We'll get to it. But did it come back? No? No, it did not. Not not with coffee. I have a sensitivity to like perfumey smells right now, but that has actually gotten better these last few weeks. It's not as extreme anymore. I mean, it's literally, it was to the point where I could not go anywhere where there were a lot of people like forget about going to the movies or a concert you know where people dress up and wear their colognes and their perfumes a lot because they want to smell good and look good that was impossible for me to do but it's really gotten better these last couple of weeks so maybe that's got to do with my liver healing a little bit better i don't know i am so glad that it has because i again can empathize with what you went through i had never had sensitivities to scent smells before in my life When I was at my sickest, which was in early 2020, late 2019, I could not stand the smell of anything. If there was a candle in the room, if like you said, there were people with colognes on, I would immediately get triggered by headaches, brain fog. I'd feel nauseous. It was really, really bad to the point where I still now, even some detergents, um, you know, like laundry detergent smells, Mm -hmm. I I can't do it. I have to have everything scent free still but I'm so, so much better. And it's what got me into dynamic neural retraining system by Annie Hopper, which is rewiring your brain, which helped a great deal in that regard. But looking back now, one of the first things I did, and we'll get into when you found Sally later on, but it was lowering the oxalates definitely assisted that. Would you agree with your 
journey on that? Uh, it probably did. Yeah, no doubt about that. So as we move on in your journey, Doris, I found it interesting that in your teens, you developed Osgood Slaughter syndrome. Now, a lot of listeners, uh, again, it's in Michael's podcast, he does a good job of just explaining what it is, but I wonder if you could tell folks what happened there and what it is and, and how that's going now for you. Yeah, that is something that happens in the teenage years as you are having growth spurts. And it is where in your knees, some un- the doctor explained it to us that we are growing so fast that our bones can't keep up with the growth or some bones can't keep up with it. And so the bone from like one of the shin bones gets pulled up uh, and it just creates this big bump. And underneath that bump, there's actually there must have been some kind of liquid or something because um, one of the girls in our class had it as well. And she had to have an operation. She had like a pus sack underneath that needed to be removed because there was an infection going on, which my sister and I both who had it thankfully never had to have done. Uh, But yeah, it was, we were told it had to do with us growing too fast and it was difficult because we were both into sports, playing volleyball, basketball, and it was really sensitive to touch. Now, when you play volleyball, you have to be on your knees all the time and it would just get aggravated and get worse and worse until it was just really swollen and it was hard to bend the knee. And it's something that goes away if you are not moving too much, not doing too much quicker. Uh, so ours was hanging around for a good two years, I'd say. And the bump is still there. It's big, but I have not had any issues with it. Uh, Yeah, maybe I want to say it stopped when I was 15, 16. The pain went away. But I didn't know until Michael mentioned it that that is also caused by oxalates, which, of course, now makes sense. That's why all the other kids who had major growth spurts didn't get that issue. And, you know, it was just the three kids in the class who had a really high oxalate diet. You know, so many things, as we've learned, haven't we, Doris, are tying back to our dietary high ox childhood choices. And out of interest, at this time, when you went to visit physicians regarding this uh, or condition, what were you told to eat? Were you t- Did you change your diet at all at that time? What were you eating in the teens? There were no dietary questions asked whatsoever. It was all about, this is, you know, a growth spurt and you know, just keep on eating, eat a lot because you're a growing person and you need the nutrients, but there was no, what are you eating? And sadly that continues to be a big part yeah. of the diagnose and adios uh, system that we're in these days, although it is a little better. I will say it is a little better. I, I was blessed with a physician late on when I was very sick who was concerned, um, you know, about what my choices were. Oxalate was never involved, but the lack of protein or animal protein in the diet was a concern being a vegan, but we were talking before we started recording today, Doris, about the sort of next stage in your life after the teens. I assume you're continuing to eat a lot of high ox stuff um, where you continue to eat all the rhubarb, the beets. When did you start getting into, I know there was a part where you started having a lot of hip issues. Was that late teens, early twenties? That started mid-teens actually, Uh, but that was off and on. And I had, you know, all sorts of ideas in my head what would have caused that, you know, being a twin, I was on the bottom in the womb and I had misshapen legs. So I was put in a body cast for the first four weeks of my life to straighten my legs. Um, And I thought maybe somehow they messed up how they put the cast onto my body when it comes to my right hip, that there was something off. And then I also, which I think is what it is, when I was 13, I had an accident on the balance beam and my leg went in a direction it shouldn't have gone. And there was, you know, major soft tissue injury. And I'm sure oxalates were deposited into that area after that injury. And that is what started that whole saga. And then when I was in my mid-teens, I would have pain on and off. And By the time I was 19, that was constant. And if I would try and walk for long periods of time, it was just incredibly painful. I could not step forward too far and not leave my leg behind too far because it would feel as though my leg was going to dislocate, my hip was going to dislocate. Without jumping too far ahead, Doris, 
when you are currently dumping, does that hip give you problems or is that sort of not part of the dumping process for you now? Well, that hip does give me problems, but not in a way that it used to for those 20 years that I had that pain. It's it's in a different area and it causes different issues. I don't know. I no longer feel like it's going to dislocate at any time if I do too big of a movement. So Doris, when you were seeing the people about your hip, what did they say to you? What did they t- tell you was wrong? I, I'm smiling because I, I can only imagine. They couldn't find anything wrong with it. I don't know how many times I've gone to Kaiser uh, because the worst it was worst after I moved to the United States and then I got Kaiser Permanente and I was like, there's something wrong with this hip. There's got to be something in there that is grinding or or something. I don't know. And I would go every two months when I felt, okay, this is really bad right now. I can barely walk. Somehow somebody has got to see something on an x-ray and nothing was ever found. No, it looks completely fine. There's nothing wrong with it. We can't see anything wrong. Then you feel like a dang hypochondriac because you're over there every two months asking for an x-ray because you're sure your hip is about to fall out and your leg's just going to be behind you and nothing, absolutely nothing. And I just figured, you know what, I'm just going to be a person who's going to need an early hip replacement. And that's that. Oh, super frustrating. And I know how that can be. I, I, I often tell the story of how I felt like a human pincushion trying to get to the bottom of how I felt, because no matter how, I mean, I I looked ill, there was no doubt at the, the last sort of worst stages for me. I was very gaunt. I had lost a ton of weight down to 127 pounds. I had chronic Epstein-Barr viral replicating in me. uh, So my my immune system was shot. It was no fun. I had what my doctor thought was colitis, of course. Anyway, I say that all to say that it was very frustrating because no matter how many tests they did, they came back inconclusive. And as we're going to talk about in, in a little bit, it took what I put in my mouth, changing that to overcome everything almost absolutely everything so doris then what what's next for you you've got these hip problems you're you're still you're still on the diet that's definitely high oxalate albeit yeah. you know you're including the meats it, where did you turn next what what was that when you were frustrated you weren't getting the answers that you needed what happened oh i just lived with that hip pain for 20 years because there was nothing else i could do right So, but then I got to a certain age where I thought, okay, you know what? I don't want to end up like my parents. I don't want to have these issues. So let me start to eat healthier. And I started to include more greens (laughs) into my diet, which, you know, was just super helpful. And I started fermenting, doing a lot of sauerkraut and beet kvass and started doing um, kombucha which is very healthy, right? It's all probiotic. And I double fermented that with elderberry syrup. And if it's a good thing, then more of a good thing is better as we all make those mistakes. And at first I felt great, you know, the first year because I had cut out, uh, well, I should go back to the hip thing because I had cut out all sugar, right? Because I thought, well, maybe that was the culprit. We all know sugar is bad for us. And having grown up in Germany and constantly getting candy from all your relatives, you eat a lot of that. So I, after I cut that out, that also included a lot of chocolate covered nuts that I had been eating, you know, peanuts, almonds. And that is when my hip pain went away after 20 years. Like it was completely gone. I no longer needed a scooter to get around. I could walk the dog for miles, no problem no pain, no issues. And I thought, well, it was the sugar. And it felt great for a year. And then I started having other issues. And I thought, okay, I'll drink more of the kombucha. I'll eat more of the sauerkraut. I'll have more of the beet kvass. And next thing I know, I found myself in the hospital with toxic hepatitis, autoimmune uh, hepatitis. And so my liver was failing. And I thought I was going to die. I was so weak, just getting out of bed to take a shower exhausted me for the rest of the day. Um, I stopped eating and drinking because when you have hepatitis, you have absolutely no appetite. And that might have saved my life because had I continued to eat and drink what I was 
doing, it probably would have killed me. And I think that's the body's way of making sure you don't eat that you can actually heal some of that stuff or stop the onslaught of poison that is coming into your body that is killing you. And um, I did get better and I got past that. But that was a really scary time. I can only imagine Doris. And again, just thinking back to my own story and laying there again, fatigued. Uh, they were testing me for hepatitis as well um, at my sickest because I was so fatigued. A part of that was the chronic Epstein bar. Part of that was I was not absorbing any of my food properly. I was so weak. And you know, you mentioned something earlier, and I think a little piece of the puzzle, if you'll allow me to paint for the listeners was, you know, you mentioned that you didn't want to be like the older folks, like your parents, what happened to them? I, I believe your mom had kidney failure. Is that correct? Right. Yep. She had kidney failure. She had a long list of issues, though, that um, were very clearly oxalate related, which started in her 40s when she had thyroid issues. And she went into the hospital and got the uh, radio radioactive iodine treatment. And then in her 50s, she lost her gallbladder. Uh, she had two large stones, which of course now I know are calcium oxalates um, that were in there. One of them was worn down by the other and it had like this little divots on each side. And every time one would rub against the other, she would have what they would call a colic and pain. And so that was gone. And then in her 60s, uh, she had renal failure. And my mother ate a lot of beets as well. And, you know, all the rope, like everything I ate as a kid, that was her diet. And for my dad, I remember being a kid uh, sitting across from him at the dinner table. And in his 50s, he started to have all these facial muscle twitches that were involuntary under his eye. And they were so strong. It literally looked like there was an alien underneath his skin, just pulling and yanking around on stuff. And he um, had small strokes throughout that we didn't know were strokes. There was no medical intervention for them. Uh, but I remember one time we were in the car driving to my grandma's and looking back, I knew now that he had a stroke in the car while driving because all of a sudden we were driving on the sidewalk, up and down on the sidewalk, almost like he was drunk. And then it stopped and it was fine. And we didn't know what had happened and we went on and he went on with his day like completely normal but then he had a really massive stroke um when he was 66 and that was all oxalate related stuff he had a pacemaker when he was uh, 54 uh which i'm sure was due to the oxalate high diet and then my sister you know mental illness throughout her whole life, basically, from her early teens on, diagnosed with everything from schizophrenia to clinical depression to bipolar and on all sorts of medication and antipsychotics for basically her whole adult life, nothing of which ever helped. And nobody ever mentions diet with anything. You said something with Michael that uh, that struck me. You, you said that uh, uh, you were trying to be healthy, but nearly killed yourself. And that's exactly what, you know, I did all, the vegan diet for all the right yeah. reasons. And I was making these decisions based on what I thought was right, blending up spinach with almond milk adding turmeric because it's anti-inflammatory. <laughs> oh and, and Doris, you and I, I'm shivering now actually thinking about it. You and I share the same scary thoughts about chia seeds and chia seeds, what they did to our, not only my digestion um, caused a blockage in me because I was literally putting cupfuls, like two or three cupfuls of chia seeds in these smoothies. <laughs> I and, did, never did that much. I, oh. I had a few tablespoons in my chia, my kefir chia pudding every, every morning, which I love with blueberries. Oh my gosh, it was so good. It was delicious. I, again, listening to the interview with Michael, I'm so sorry to have heard about your sister. I know it impacted you greatly. I don't, you know, unless you want to discuss further, I'll just say that I'm, I'm very sorry. It had a, you know, huge impact as it would on anyone in their lives. And I'm sorry to hear what she went through during her life. COVID then hit. This is about the same time frame that I was very sick when COVID hit and could not find answers because it was COVID and our hospital was locked down and all these things. So what happened to you then after that, Doris? I'm, I'm even nervous to ask. Yeah. So the, the COVID thing, that's when I really started to where my health fell apart. And I, I don't know if part of all 
this whole oxalate stuff has to do with could I have eaten more oxalates and not had any reaction had I not been so stressed about so many things? I don't know how trauma affects a person, you know, um, because I felt great up until, I mean, even once I'd gotten out of the hepatitis, I felt fairly great again. And then when COVID hit and I was home, even though I've been told, don't worry about your job, don't worry about how many months you need to stay home, we're going to pay you. I shouldn't have been stressed. But at the same time, my sister got her cancer diagnosis and I couldn't travel. So there was this awful guilt about not being able to be there for her, you know, getting to Germany at least for a few weeks. And it was definitely affecting me in a way where all of a sudden I had anxiety, which I had never had before. I started to have panic attacks. Like, where the heck does that come from? And I blamed it all on, it's the stress. It's the stress. You were sick. You had hepatitis. Your body isn't completely healthy yet. You're still dealing with that. I had constant pain in my upper right quadrant still at that point. And then I thought, all right, the stress with the COVID, your sister, you're just stressed to the max. And I would get mood swings all of a sudden, which I had never had, and really major anger outbursts. And my dad had those. And I, I remember thinking, good freaking gosh, I'm turning into my dad. What is happening with me? And it's actually amazing that my marriage survived that. And thank God it didn't go on for too long. And that I didn't lose my job because I would literally look for fights, just trying to pick fights. And I didn't understand where that was coming from. I had no idea that that was also oxalate related. And then after my sister had taken her life in August of 21, I that went down in a really weird way too with her not being able to be found. Um, that's when the insomnia came along. And I blamed that on my, dis on my sister's suicide because I thought, yeah, of course, that would keep you from sleeping because that is on your mind and you're just kind of going crazy here and you try and deal with it by meditating and anything and everything that you can find to mitigate and try and find that sleep and then of course not being able to sleep makes the other symptoms that you're dealing with way worse so you're more irritable and the mood swings are worse and you're more anxious than ever before and the panic attacks are coming more often and then I had, right after I kind of healed from the hepatitis, I had looked online, you know, and found Ken Berry and Sean Baker and the carnivore diet. And I thought, maybe I should do that. And I had talked to my physician about it, my general practitioner, and she had me on this kind of keto diet. You know, she was all in on the way I was eating with lots of vegetables and a lot of spinach. And she said, yeah, I wouldn't do it because you need the fiber. You know, you, you cannot eat meat only. That would be really unhealthy. And she basically scared me out of doing that. But a year later, after I was feeling literally worse than ever before, I just thought, you know what? It was November and I was just going to go cold turkey carnivore. I was like, screw what the doctor's saying. I've watched plenty of these videos. I've seen so many people's success stories. I need to feel better. I cannot continue to live like that. And so I did it. I went cold turkey from eating a lovely high oxalate keto diet to eating nothing but meat and eggs and butter. And it was great at first. And then I went into a sort of a flu-like state where I had my microbiome die off because they didn't get the fiber and certain sugars anymore, but lasted for a day and a half. And then I felt great for a couple of days. And then I, uh, then I went into straight on oxalate doubling and I started getting rashes. It started on the back of my calves, little itchy bumps, and they continued to move higher every day. There were more and they were higher up on my legs. And it felt like fiberglass coming out of my skin. I couldn't see anything. But when I put on my clothing, the clothing would get stuck on it. And it was incredibly itchy and uncomfortable and burning and stinging. And then it was, you know, on my buttocks. It was up on my flanks. And it was on my arms. 
particularly around the elbow area. And I started going to the doctors. What is this? Nobody's asking about a diet. What are you doing? What are you eating? Are you, have you changed anything recently? Um, I always got, well, we can tell you what it isn't, but we can't tell you what it is. But here are some steroids. Here's some steroid. Go put that on. I'm like, you can't tell me what I've got, but I'm supposed to put steroids over my largest organ. I'm not going to do that. That is insane because I hate pharmaceuticals. I, I, I won't ever just take anything or do anything that a doctor gives me. And so it got worse. Then the insomnia got even worse. Um, then I started having these lightheadedness and dizziness. I would get tingling in my arms and my legs. There were times I literally felt I'm about to have a heart attack. I don't know what's going on. But then when you go and get your blood work done, by the time you get there, nothing shows up, right? Even if you were completely out of balance with your electrolytes, by the time you get that blood drawn, it all shows up normal again. But my blood was so incredibly thick, it was like molasses. It took forever to fill vials at that time. And it made no sense to me because I felt I was so well hydrated. Now I know, of course, that it was major electrolyte imbalances from the oxalate dumping that had started. Just floodgates were opened and it was my body was just like, all right, out with that stuff. And I couldn't sleep anyway. So I was online basically all night trying to figure out what in the name of Christmas Eve is wrong with me because I wasn't getting any help from the doctors I saw, you know, and I went from my GP to dermatologist to a couple of different doctors, none of which could tell me what was going on. I don't know. At some point I put in something like crystals or needles coming out of my body and Somehow I got to Sally K. Norton's website and it was like the blinders fell off my, my eyes. I realized that, oh my gosh, I bet you this is it. So the next morning I took some pictures of my rashes and stuff and I, I sent it to Sally because you couldn't book an appointment that was out several weeks and I'm like, I cannot wait for weeks to figure out. I'm just going to send these pictures. Maybe she'll respond. Maybe she doesn't. And I sent them to her in a DM on Instagram. And she was like, yep, that looks like oxalate dumping to me. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have an answer. And then I just plowed through her stuff, anything I could find to figure out until I could get an appointment how to help myself. And it's been uphill from there. Doris, I said it before we started recording. Uh, it was the same thing for me. I was like, I went carnivore, you know. Did you go I, cold turkey too, just from one to the other? I didn't. What What happened with me was um, I found Sally, thankfully, you know, at the time that I did, because I was literally thinking I wasn't going to be around much longer. And I typed in good old Google and I typed something along the lines of can, can, plants be harmful. And I came across Sally's YouTube presentation, Lost Seasonality and the Overconsumption of Plants. And that caused my rabbit hole into everything. And I went down that rabbit hole. I binged every single podcast that she had ever appeared on till that point. People like Carnivore Cast. I think she was on Carnivore Yogi, who's Sarah Kleiner Wellness now. And she was on Dr. Saladino's early. I listened to all of that stuff. And then I found the carnivore diet and I thought, ah, there's no oxalates in meat. I am going to just eat meat only. And I did it. I went cold turkey after that. I, I, I did low ox to start and I, and I started to feel better. And my, you know, us men, we can be really stubborn. You know, I went full throttle. Mm, let's go. I'm just going to go cold turkey carnivore and see how I do. And I like you, but for me, mine, my honeymoon period was about three months. I felt like better than my old self in years for those first three months. I had the little keto flu like you, where I felt kind of crummy, where I, my microbiome changed too. My stools were inconsistent for a few weeks. Yeah. But after that, I was like, all right, I feel great. And then the third month happened and kaboom, I started dumping like crazy. Like you, I reached out to Sally online. I'm like, I found her and like you, I prayed that she would have the time to respond and God bless her. I, she did. I was like, Sally, what's happening? What's going on? She's like, Hey, Hey, cowboy, what are you doing here? You need to slow down a little, add some oxalate foods back in. Since then I've chose blueberries as my only thing that I have. That's sort of outside. I am, that's what I do too. 
Yeah. And we'll, we're going to get into the other things, but thank goodness for Sally K. Norton and the others, Monique Attinger and her stuff. She was also very helpful and instrumental early on because I joined the Trying Low Oxalate groups on Facebook as well early on. And she was very kind. I mentioned to her to message me once or twice early on in my journey. But the things we learned, oh my goodness, Doris. So you then found out about oxalates. You had been doing carnivore. What type of changes did you make afterwards now that you started to learn more and more about this way of living now, which is, it is a way of living low oxalate after you've been oxalate yeah. toxic is, is for life afterwards, for sure. Yeah, it is. Let me go back for one second, because um, as I was trying to figure out what was going on with me and seeing different doctors, you know, besides the rash, I then started to have really dry eyes. I had no more tears. Um, I had dry mouth. My tongue was literally looking like a dry riverbed. There were cracks in it. It was incredibly painful. And then they diagnosed me with Sjogren syndrome and told me that I would have to live with this for the rest of my life. There really isn't any medication. Uh, these symptoms would pop up and I would have to live with them. And that's when I was just like, oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to, because I wasn't born this way. Something caused this and I'm going to figure out what that was. And I'm not going to live with these symptoms for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, I, I, after I went carnivore, um, and then found Sally and he told me that I had to put some oxalates back into my diet to slow down the dumping. Um, and, what kind of supplements to take. Now, I'm not a big fan of supplements, but I started all the citrates, the calcium, magnesium, and potassium citrate, and that helped a lot. I mean, at that point, I was with my rash for about six months or so, and I don't know if it was the citrates that helped, but the rash went away. And my dry eyes slowly started to get better. My dry mouth slowly started to get better. And I learned that putting salt under my tongue would really help with getting saliva glands going. And that would be very beneficial. And I started to put blueberries and lemon juice into my diet again, because blueberries, especially the white ones, they're a little higher ox. Um, but they're not too high oxalate and the lemon juice with the vitamin C uh, doing an endogenous possible if you have a little too much production of oxalates, that was helpful to me. And I mean, my electrolyte imbalances were gone almost immediately. My kidney function was back to normal again, because that was also um, completely off. But I never like I can't look at anything leafy green and put it in my mouth. I just, I have this psychological block where I now literally cannot get myself to eat that anymore. It's impossible for me to put it into my mouth. It's, it's really funny how once you start learning about something, how that can affect your psyche and literally block you from physically block you from getting something past your lips. Just to go back very, very quickly yeah. again. So similar. I was being tested for Sjogren's at the end there. I can remember Doris, my skin was cracking. My nails were cracking. My eyes were dry all the time. My tongue, I had, um, I constantly was putting ice in my mouth because I had no hydration. It felt like I had no mm -hmm. saliva or yeah. trying to chew gum to, to stimulate my saliva going. It was awful. Nothing. Yeah. It's the worst feeling. Awful. I am so that, you know, the, oftentimes people, people ask me because I had so many symptoms. They're asking, they asked me, James, well, which, which one is the one that you're so happy, the most happy about that you don't have anymore. And it's, it's tough to pick. I must say the fatigue was unrelenting and I, I could not survive that crushing fatigue where I couldn't feel like I could do anything in the day. But Looking back, that one as well, the the dry mouth, the dry eyes, and the brain fog for me were the worst. Just the brain fog was terrible. Just going back to the positives now, because I want to get back to the positives, Doris, how long did it take for you for your mood and panic attacks and anxiety to improve when you went this route? Incredibly fast. That was that was the few things that went just, I, it was almost like the flip of a switch. I was sleeping immediately again and once you're sleeping everything else kind of fell into place very quickly i mean that literally a, a couple of weeks tops 
that was gone. The wife was very happy. It's like, oh my gosh, I have my person back. It's because it takes its toll on not just the person who's suffering from these issues, but everybody around them, you know, and, and you try and mask it because you don't know what the heck's going on, but it's difficult when it just comes out and you have no control over it because it's a neurotoxic reaction. Doris, I'm so happy to hear you say these things because it's exactly what myself and so many others that are going through it now that will hopefully be able to listen to this or have gone through it and then still can't understand why they were the way they were. It, you have to understand, it, you hit the nail on the head, Doris, these are neurotoxins. And my personality and mood changed completely from the person you see now, smiling, having a laugh. I was none of those things. I was angry. I was depressed. Yeah. I was scared. Um, I would like you have mood swings where I'm like, what the heck is going on? Why am, why am I raising my voice? I don't understand this. Nothing, but it's your, yeah. your mental state is so severely affected by this. Absolutely. So you're seeing all these improvements. The skin dumping had gone at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then I had three beautiful months where I felt awesome. Like all summer last year, I felt great. I felt fantastic. And I thought, could I be, could I be done with this? Am I done? This is fantastic. What the heck? I had such a high oxalate diet. Okay. So every winter I was dumping as a kid. So it just kind of all went out. And because when you skin dump, I hate it, but when it happens, it's great because that is such a large organ and there's so much toxin coming out of that skin at one time that I literally thought for a moment that I could possibly be done. I mean, it just came all out through my skin, right? And I enjoyed that summer last year so much. It was just great. I felt awesome. I had no pains. I was sleeping like a baby. I was in a good mood all the time. And then fall came and the dumping came back. I had the skin dumping again, though I have to say, if it was at an eight or a nine the first time around, now I'm at a three or a four. It was completely manageable. It wasn't nearly as bad and it didn't come with all the other mood swing and insomnia issues. It was um, really mild compared to the first time around um, and didn't stay as long either. It stayed uh, maybe two and a half, three months this time before the skin dumping went away again. Uh, but what was interesting, my first round, it felt like I had little needles coming out, like fiberglass. And the second round, I had literal like sand grain type of crystals coming out of my skin. I would uh, get so itchy the first round that I had to scrape with a knife on my skin because it looked like it was just dry skin that would come off but you don't have your skin turnover that much there were crystals in there too because I could take the scrapings that I had on the knife and rub them on some copper that was oxidized and it would polish the metal so I knew at that point that I definitely had crystals in there that were coming out that was harsh enough to polish metal that's not a normal thing, right? We shouldn't have things like that coming out of our bodies. Those are toxins that we ate that are now finding their way out. And it was very eye-opening to me that everything that I have learned from Sally is completely correct. And that no matter what my doctor or any other physician says that, you know, it doesn't affect you unless you have the wrong gut bacteria. It's all a load of BS. It affects every single person whether they know it yet or not. And maybe they'll never know until they're 87 years old. But if you eat that diet, you will accumulate the toxin and who knows what it does in your body. But going back, Doris, to what you were saying, it, it's it's so true. And I think it's a, it's a glimmer of hope for those folks that are oxalate toxic and are like when you and I did putting the pennies together, they're dropping and going, oh my goodness, this could be what's happened to me. Yeah. is that as the dumping starts, Jeannie, 
you know, God bless her often talks about this, that proverbial oasis in the desert where you have a honeymoon period, it does get closer. So as you, if you're crawling through the desert for the first time and it seems to take forever, those oases come along a lot sooner as you go onward in your journey. Doesn't mean it's completely done with and they get a lot easier too, I believe. I mean, Sally said, you know, re recently that she was in her ninth year and things are pretty much by the ninth year. <laughs> that still seems crazy, but the ninth year, it's slowed down enough where she doesn't really notice as much anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's easy to say, right? Well, I want this to be gone right now. It's the moment I go carnivore. I mean, I've eaten high oxalates for five decades. I can't expect it to be over in five days as much as I would like to be. I I think I'm lucky that I went into dumping right away because I believe for those people who don't, go into dumping or clearing right away that maybe there is a problem with malnutrition more so than anything else and their bodies just aren't able to do it. So I'm very grateful that I started this right away because for me, it gives me hope that my body is strong enough to do it. But yeah, it's it's difficult when you're in that harsh dumping cycle to wrap your mind around all the symptoms and problems you don't have anymore when you're dumping so hard that you just don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, but there's highs and lows and you just really have to pay attention um, to them and realize and kind of keep a log of, okay, what's gone? What do I no longer deal with? So yeah, I have this one big issue right now, but I know that's temporary and it's going to go away eventually. I don't know when, you know, it could be a couple of weeks. It, could be a couple of years. I mean, in one of the last interviews that Sally did, she was talking to a woman who said that for over two years, every time she smelled or ate anything that had onions or garlic in it, it felt and smelt and tasted like skunk to her. And that finally just recently changed after two years and six months or two years and eight months. Now, I hope that's not going to be that long for my joint issues that I've got going on. I'm in month seven with that right now. But um but I know it's temporary. I know it's dumping related. And I can only hope that it's going to be sooner than later. But then I don't know what's coming after that. You know, where's my body going to go next? Is that going to be worse than what I've got now? Should I just be happy because I'm able to get through my day? So yeah, it hurts when I get up and down to and from a seated position or when I bend over. Oh, when I climb the stairs, my knees are hurting or my shoulder is locked. Like I can put this arm up. This one goes right here. It's locked right there. It doesn't go any further. If it, if I push it, it hurts like hell. And it is feeling like it's going to dislocate like my hip felt for several years. I, by the way, dislocated this shoulder six times in two years, which I'm sure was also connective tissue related um, oxalate issues uh, from like, what was it? 2016, 20, yeah, 2016, 2017, six times the left shoulder went out. One last thing that I want to touch on uh, before we end out is... Again, something similar, and I've said this many times today that you and I share, and that was the teeth issues related wow. to oxalates. You ended up with um, something called osteomyelitis. Um, yeah. So please tell the listeners about what happened there. So um, that was this year in January, I started having um, tooth pain under my number 19 left side there. And I went to my dentist, got an x-ray there's nothing wrong. She can't see anything. Uh, so I kind of put a check mark onto oxalo dumping because she said it could be just a ligament that's inflamed. And I'm thinking, well, oxalo dumping, ligaments, not a, out of the question that that could be an oxalate related thing. Uh, the pain lasted for five, six days. And then literally one morning as I was in bed, like with a pop, the pain went away. And that cleared it up for me. It's definitely oxalate dumping. So then a month later, the same pain comes back. Um, this time I don't call my dentist. I don't go see her because I'm figuring, okay, another little round of oxalate dumping from that area. No problem. If it gets worse, maybe I'll give her a call. Seven days later, it's gone. Then March comes and I get the same pain Actually, that's not true. I don't get any pain. I'm doing brushing my teeth, flossing one night, and I notice there's a bump on the side of that number 19. So I call my dentist on Tuesday morning. They're closed on Mondays. Hey, um, remember that tooth I came in for? You took the x-ray where I had the pain. There's a bump now. I'm having an abscess that is coming. Um, 
she's like, well, we're kind of swamped. Can it wait until Thursday? Are you in a lot of pain? I'm like, no pain at all, just an abscess forming. So then by Wednesday, the abscess is really big and there's a couple of dots and, you know, I push on it and there's, sorry, gross pus coming out, but then it looks normal again. I go see my dentist the next day and she thinks, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. I mean, clearly there's an abscess. I can't see an issue with your tooth. So she sends me to the endodontist because she thinks maybe there's a fracture somehow that she with her x-ray can't see. I need a better x-ray. And so I go to the endodontist and she takes a couple of x-rays. She can't see anything wrong with the tooth either and tells me that there, there is bone loss. Like if this is your root, right in between the roots of the tooth, there is bone loss. And she can't explain why, because there is nothing she can see in the tooth that there is an issue. Like, no, you don't need a crown. I, I don't understand. Well, what do I do? So she goes, well, you can either go to an oral surgeon and have the tooth extraction, uh, extracted because there is bone loss, or you can see a periodontist who maybe could try and save the tooth. Well, what would you do? I don't know what to do. You say there's nothing wrong with my tooth. I don't want to go to an oral surgeon and lose a tooth. I'm 54 years old. I shouldn't be losing teeth. And she goes, why don't you take the weekend to think it over and then call me on Monday and let me know what you want to do. And then about three hours later, the endodontist calls me back and tells me that she's looked at the x-rays with a couple of her colleagues and she would suggest I go see an oral surgeon because she doesn't think there's any chance the tooth could be saved. So I'm upset about that, but I go ahead and I call the oral surgeon that very afternoon on Friday. And they tell me that the first possible appointment um, I've got is two weeks from now. They're really booked. I'm like, okay, great. All right, I'll take that. 10 minutes later, she calls me back and says they just had a cancellation for tomorrow. If I could come tomorrow morning, Saturday, I'm like, okay, clearly that's meant to be something in the universe is telling me that tooth needs to come out. And I was at the oral surgeon the next morning and I told him to save the tooth because I want to take it home. Um, I'm a learned goldsmith. I have a jeweler's microscope in the back so that I could look at it underneath the microscope, you know, with kind of go through it with a fine tooth comb. Uh, and so they put the tooth in a baggie for me. And once I kind of got out of that grogginess from the anesthesia, I took it back there to the microscope and was scraping away the gooky stuff that should have been bone, but was all infected tissue stuff. And there was a tiny pinhole in the root of the tooth, one of the roots that came down. And that is how bacteria somehow got into my bone and started eating away at my jawbone. And I'm sure that pinhole wouldn't have been there had my teeth not been loading up on oxalates for 50 darn years. Um, so yeah, and there's definitely been dumping going on on that whole left side. My bite is constantly off. There's teeth shifting around. Uh, and I'm constantly at the dentist making sure that nothing else is happening there. Um, but yeah, that's all thanks to the oxalates. Folks will always want to know, you know, because they're when we're starting out, we're confused. We're trying to piece all these pieces of a puzzle together. Yeah. What What are you eating and taking currently, uh, Doris, in your own diet? I mean, just to give an example of folks, what it, what does a day of eating sort of look like for you and, and supplementation, if you wouldn't mind? Right. So supplements, I do no longer do any i have them in case i need them but i'm very weary of supplements because they're all made by basically the same companies that poison us right um so i start off my day with salt water and then i have a glass of milk raw milk i drink an incredible amount of milk because the amount of minerals i get from there is what perhaps induces oxalate dumping to a point but it also helps me get the nutrients that my body needs in order to get rid of the oxalates so uh yeah i have milk and salt water first thing in the morning and then when i get to work after i get the kids off to school i have breakfast which is usually bacon and eggs um, which is very quick. And then for lunch, I'll throw a couple of burgers on the grill 
uh, and have some more milk with that, usually two cups of milk with that. And then in the evening when I get home, or sometimes before I get home, if I work late, I throw some more meat or a pork chop onto the grill and have that for dinner. And then before I go to bed, I have another cup of milk. And I put blueberries into uh, Greek yogurt, um, along with a little extra cream and egg yolks for a little snack if I need something extra. I'm on my feet all day. I don't have a desk job. I move all day long. I do an average of 20,000 steps a day. So I definitely eat probably a lot more than the average person does um, because on the weekends, I notice when I don't move as much, I don't need to eat as much. Um, but yeah, as um, supplements, my only supplements right now are the lemon water, which I have, and the milk. Those are my two main supplements that I that I do for my oxalate dumping. Thank you for sharing that, Doris. And we're very similar. We, you and I, again, so similar in how we eat and and um, things like that. I, I, as I mentioned, I take the sea salt. I do the little hot lemon water first thing in the morning, and then I have my breakfast, which is usually usually two burger patties, some raw cheese, and and uh, three eggs. And then lunchtime is just, again more burger patties. And then in the evening, it's a grill with the steak. Yeah, I put pictures; people can see them on my yeah. Instagram if they yeah. follow me. Last question, how for you, do you know, what is your signs for signs that a dump is on its way or, or about to start? Well, unfortunately, my dumps last for months. I've been in this last last dump for, for seven months. And um, for me, it's easy to tell my urine is bubbly in the morning when I get up, which tells me that clearly my body's been working hard last night. And um then it gets better throughout the day. And then in the evening, it's probably one more time. Uh, so I know as long as I have that going on, I'm still in the dump. And right now, since mid-February, I've been in this joint issue dump, which is arthritis. And I've looked into, okay, could it be the dairy? I cut out the dairy forcefully while we were on our vacation because I couldn't get raw milk in um, Idaho or Montana or in Wyoming, though I've tried. Uh, but couldn't locate it. And so I had two weeks where I felt the worst I felt in a while during this dump period where I couldn't sleep again. The joint pain was so bad, I could barely move. Like hikes, big hikes were completely out of the question because I was in so much joint pain. And there was another thing going on. I should probably go into that because maybe somebody else might have that issue. I had some kind of lining shed in my body that came out through my urine there were literally white chunks that were like feathers in water floating around, which was, I don't know whether it was a bladder lining or whether it came from my kidneys, but something came out that would have two years ago freaked me out, running, screaming to my doctor, I'm dying, I'm dying. Now I was just like, okay, oxalate dumping is the weirdest thing. And since there was no pain or blood involved, I didn't even bother to go to the doctor because more than likely they just shrugged their shoulders. We don't know what this is. Um, but that lasted three days. And so once we got back and I was able to have the milk again, I immediately felt better. So I know that my joint issue is not from like a dairy or an egg allergy. All of a sudden, it is the dumping that is going on right now. And I had also issues in my joint thumb. And that lasted three weeks only. And that is completely gone. So I know bigger joints, longer issues. Uh, but yeah, my dumps last many months before they're over. And the P is the best way for me to, to tell that, yeah, I'm still in it. This is still going on. And of course, I feel it because my joints feel like crap. I really appreciate you taking the time out today to sit and chat and share your story. It is super inspiring and hopeful for people. And with that being said, what advice or words of encouragement could you give to folks, Doris, that are deducing that they may have an oxalate toxicity problem and are just beginning on this journey or maybe in the throes of the dumping and ready to give up? What would you say? I would say your first defense is to go get Toxic Superfoods by Sally K. Norton. Get that book while it's still on the market before they take it off because it goes against all medical advice and learn about what oxalates are and how they can affect you and then try and figure out how you've lived the last decades that you've been alive and what you've been eating and if that could be it. And if so, 
just follow the advice, you know, take out your oxalate really slowly. Don't go cold turkey and do something like we did because even though many symptoms disappear very quickly, others pop up that you've never had and they're no fun to deal with either, um, especially for older people. You know, I'd say if you're over 60, go extremely slow. Look at what you're eating daily and take your highest oxalate food and just take that out for six months before you touch anything else and replace that one with a good quality carnivore food. You know, don't substitute spinach for nuts or anything like that. And then in six months time, do another one. Take another one of your high oxalate foods out, you know, get rid of the potatoes or whatever it is that is your next food that you eat a lot of that is in the plant variety of highly toxic foods. Doris, thank you so much again for spending the time with me today. We appreciate you and just keep doing what you're doing. Get out there, advocate, share your story. It's a powerful one. I know this is going to help somebody out there and I just want to wish you the very best and please stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, James. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap on this episode of Carnivorous Chats. If you've made it this far, I want to say thank you for listening and also thank you in advance for liking, subscribing, or sharing this episode. Thanks again to Equip Foods, Carnivore Snacks, and The Carnivore Bar. Don't forget to check the link in the show notes to get a discount on their products. Until the next time, be well 